Welcome to the Go To Book Club. I'm Stephen Nunez, and today I'm thrilled to talk about a book that captures the excitement and joy when programming Phoenix Live View. Uh, programming Phoenix Live View, that's the book. Uh, I'm joined today by its co-authors, Bruce Tate and Sophie De Benedetto, um, and I want to just dive right into it. Bruce, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am a, the founder of a, a company that teaches Elixir developers to code Live View and OTP, and then some of Elixir itself. And I have also been involved in the Elixir publishing community for a good long while. Uh, I was the original editor of the Elixir source line of books at the Pragmatic Bookshelf. So I've been involved with Elixir since before version 1.0, and I'm excited to talk about this topic today. That's so cool. Um, again, just like so many great Elixir books that you've been not only a part of, have written, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, Sophie, how about you? Uh, yeah, thank you for introducing us and hanging out here today. I'm Sophie Benedetto. I am also the co-author, along with Bruce, of the programming Phoenix Live View book out in beta now on Pragmatic Bookshelf. A um, little bit about sort of my programming background. I'm a staff engineer now at GitHub, where, you know, before you ask, we don't use any Elixir or Beam languages, uh, sadly, or should I say, yet, you know, always holding out a tiny spark of hope. Um, my introduction to sort of the Elixir publishing world came through Bruce when I came on uh, to co-author this book with him. And Bruce, you mentioned that you were formerly the Elixir series editor at Pragmatic Bookshelf. I am the new Elixir series editor at Pragmatic Bookshelf, which basically means that my job is to help people that want to write books about Elixir for Pragmatic Bookshelf. So if you have an idea for a book and you want to talk about it, you should definitely reach out to me uh, on Twitter. I think our contact information will be uh, available if you're listening to this recording. Uh, I'm here to, to hear your idea and to help you get that proposal submitted to our proposals committee, if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, what else? Actually, along with Stephen and Bruce and a couple of other fabulous people, including Lars Vickman and Alex Kutmos, we co-host the Beam Radio podcast. Uh, Stephen is showing the Beam Radio t-shirt. And it's a very handsome t-shirt at that, courtesy, I believe, of Bruce and Maggie, who helped produce the show. So definitely check out the podcast if you haven't yet, uh, or if you like what you hear today, if you want to just listen to us hang out and talk about all things Beam. Um, what else? I like to write about Elixir. I like to write Elixir. Uh, you know, wish I could do a little bit more in my professional life, but uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been having such a wonderful time working on this book with Bruce. Chances are, if you're looking for something related to how to solve a problem in Elixir, Phoenix, you're going to run into uh, Sophie's work out there on the blogosphere. Um, the book is just an extension of that awesome writing. Um, Thank you. So you guys are directly involved with uh, Pragmatic Bookshelves, uh, Elixir line, as you mentioned, and you kind of decide what goes out. This book is obviously important to put out. Uh, not only that, I'll let readers know it's a bear. It's a huge book. Like It's a massive book, incredibly comprehensive, talking about Elixir, uh, Phoenix live view design, which we'll get into, but I, for listeners that are new to Elixir and Phoenix, what is live view and kind of what problems does it solve? What domain does it sort of exist in? Um, I'll toss that over to Sophie to start. Cool. Uh, so if you are brand new to live view and you've maybe not really heard much about it before, which was actually the audience of speaking of go to, I gave some live view talks at go to Copenhagen and I asked for like a show of hands, you know, who's worked in Live View before and one or two people raised their hands each time. So it's very cool to see that there is some broader interest in the functional programming community. Uh, if you are tuning in and you don't really know anything about Live View, but you're just a little curious, you are definitely not alone uh, amongst other functional programmers. So what is Live View? It is a real-time web development framework that is incorporated into the Phoenix web development framework, which is Elixir's web development framework. How many times will I say web development framework? It's kind of the rails of Elixir or really the rails of functional programming. And I think um, one of the cases that I tried to make in my recent talks at GoTo Copenhagen is that LiveView makes functional programming relevant to web development because up until I think even more recent versions of Live View, which makes it such a compelling choice for teams, companies, organizations, we didn't really have a go-to web dev framework beyond Phoenix, which it really is just an extension of that, um, that would sort of let functional developers 
build web apps that take advantage of a lot of the features of functional programming. So it's written in Elixir. Uh, it's written on top of OTP. So as far as functional languages go, you get the benefits of, you know, it being working with immutable data structures and you get all the other benefits that you might be used to just in, think, in terms of modeling the world with a functional framework. Um, I think the actor model is very much the principle of live view. A live view is a process and it passage, passes messages. And because it's built on top of OTP, you get all the benefits of OTP without having to actually understand how that works. So instead of like Rails magic, which abstracts away a lot of the internals of how a web application or a web server works in an object-oriented language, you get this kind of OTP magic. You get massive amounts of concurrency for free. You get fault tolerance for free. A live view is a process that backs your web page. So if it crashes, it just starts back up again. And there's lots of uh, kind of niceties around making that a seamless experience for your user. Um, so in short, it is a functional web development framework that is built on top of Elixir and OTP to bring real time web development uh, to functional programmers and to everyone else. And what it really lets us do and why I think it's taking off so much within the Elixir community and we're starting to see it take off outside of the Elixir community is that it allows you to build single page web applications with a purely server side mindset. Uh, which isn't to say that JavaScript won't be running or that you won't write any JavaScript. But if you're used to the complexity and kind of the added overhead of something like React, where you're coordinating your API and your front end code and your back end team and your front end team in dealing with onerous, uh, you know, release cycles because of that, and you're dealing with a lot of cumbersome tests because of that, you're going to pretty much write almost exclusively server side code, you're going to keep the mindset of, you know, you are developers, your team firmly on the server side, you're going to execute a purely Elixir test suite, and you're going to get all the benefits of a highly interactive real time single page app um, without, I used to say without JavaScript, but there's plenty of JavaScript in live view, you just don't have to write the boring parts, you might you don't have to write any JavaScript at all, unless you want to or need to add in something, you know, extra special and fancy, which live view lets you do pretty seamlessly. And Bruce, how about you? What, why is this important? Why is, uh, why should people think uh, live view is relevant? Yeah, and I guess I could say everything that Sobe said, but <laughs> that'd be a little bit less interesting. So let's go back to when Jose first started writing a web application or, or web application server, and that actually wasn't Phoenix. That was a, a little framework called Dynamo. And it was really his first take at what web development should be. And unsurprisingly, this, the, the use cases in, in Elixir were still evolving. The abstractions and design patterns were still evolving. And that wasn't exactly what he wanted it to be. So when he went looking for a solution to how to build web applications in Elixir, he started with a web a web server application, uh, what, Lego framework toolkit or something like that. And essentially what this thing was, was a common data element called a plug.con, a connection, and functions that worked on it. And every single one of those functions accepted a connection and returned a connection. And so you could think about Phoenix as one long, beautiful function. And with that abstraction, Chris McCord found it and they worked together to build the Phoenix framework. And so the thing that made that interesting to functional developers is that we had functional composition in a functional language and it was really beautiful. And Live View just extends that model to rather than having a request response framework, Live View supports a single page framework so that we go through this, this one long chain of plugs. We, um, we get to a point where we say, Hey, this is a live view. And then Phoenix loads the page, returns the page. And there's a little bit of pre-written JavaScript on that page that says establish a connection on a straight HTTP socket. And then from that point on, we're doing one of three things. We're establishing data. 
We're transforming that data, maybe from a button click on the page, or maybe somebody fills out a form and we need to validate that. Maybe it's some type of a slider or a link. And then the last thing is we're rendering whatever's in the socket. So that old single page applications were, were this kind of weird entangled mass of code and state. And the state came from all different places. We kind of put that stuff together in a process. And then we ac accessed it, just like Sophie said, with the actor-based model, so that you're either establishing state, changing state based on clicks, and rendering state. So maybe in the socket, we have a list of users. We have a button that says remove, remove a user. And then all that, that that button does is removes a user from the list. And then in another dimension, we just render that page when whenever the state changes. So it's really a beautiful way to build web applications. Yeah, LiveView really feels like an inevitability if you look at the OTP framework. If you Even in uh, Programming Erlang by Joe Armstrong, he talks about abstracting away interacting with a web socket and it's all actor model. It's all OTP. And when you look in, and dive into the internals of uh, live view, you get the same kind of feeling that it's like, we're just interacting with a central state and then how we render it is a bit different. I want to talk a little bit about some of the concerns that someone might have coming into live view. One of them or working with a spa in general is sort of like SEO concerns. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Sophie mentioned, you know, you're not going to have to write any JavaScript. I don't know exactly what you said, but um, how does LiveView uh, allow for those things? The SEO and sort of that big concern of like not showing up in Google. And then also like, okay, if you have to use a library that's been around forever, like how do you do that in, in LiveView? SEO is something that you mentioned. And I think it was one of the biggest concerns um, that Chris McCord and the team addressed, even at the very beginning, kind of baked into the very nature of the LiveV paradigm. Because of course, without SEO, absolutely no one will use your web development framework for your single page apps. So the beauty of LiveView, exactly as Bruce described, is that it starts out like a regular HTTP GET request, and it begins by rendering a static web page. So your live view template will first render as static HTML. Then that little bit of live view JavaScript that's embedded on the page for you for free um, will kind of kick in and open that persistent bi-directional WebSocket communication. So that SEO is going to run on that first static render. Um, so SEO is not at all a concern for live view. Um, there are many concerns that one may have when working with a single page web application. And I think that these are considerations that are not at all specific to live view. Like I said, they're very much considerations that I think anyone building web apps today may have and may share. And uh, I think live view has like an ideal solution for all of them. So not to sort of like vlog my go-to talks too much, but I did give a talk at GoTo Copenhagen um, at the beginning of October talking about really exactly this topic, sort of laying out this list of um, sort of these main and common concerns when it comes to single page web apps. And then I kind of went through each category and talked about um, the solution that LiveView has for each one. So I'm not going to try to recap my entire talk right now, but I'll give maybe just a little bit of a taste of it. So I consider sort of this, this list that I'll recite right now to be some of these common concerns. There's questions around security. How do you secure your single page apps? Uh, certainly questions around state recovery. What happens if the app crashes or if the connection is lost? That's something that JavaScript web frameworks, you know, have a lot of answers for. Um, what about file uploads? File uploading in your single page app can be notoriously, if not difficult, and maybe just kind of laden with toil. There's questions around code organization that I know we're very eager to hear from Bruce on, um, especially if you have ever worked with a really dense, nested, gnarly React app. I think the question of code organization may resonate with you. Questions around integrating JavaScript. I mentioned earlier that you don't have to write JavaScript. That doesn't mean that you don't get to write JavaScript. LiveView has a solution for that as well. And then there are also questions around efficient data transfer. And maybe I'll just go into a little bit more detail on just this one, because this is a question I would get a lot. Um, and Stephen, this is a question you and I would get from our students when we taught our LiveView workshop, which is now sadly out of date because LiveView has changed so much since we first gave it um, a year or two ago. But one of the main things that people would ask um, me when learning LiveView was, 
what if I have a lot of data that I'm trying to communicate between the client and the server? We know that a live view is backed by a process on the back end. We know that it's connected to the client over this persistent WebSocket connection. Uh, so let's say you're building some sort of Spotify type web app and you've got a bazillion songs to send down to the client um, or to make available to the user in some way and to allow them to interact with. Um, LiveView always strove to minimize data transfer and make that communication as efficient as possible, which it did from the outset and still does when it comes to rendering the smallest possible page diffs when the state of your page has changed. But if you have, like I said, a bazillion songs, you have a bazillion songs. It doesn't really solve for that problem. Um, LiveView does solve for that problem since a couple of months ago, I think at this point, with the streams uh, feature set in LiveView, which basically allows you to manage really large data sets in your LiveView by detaching it from the server and storing it primarily client side. And if it kind of makes you shiver a little bit to say you're going to manage a huge amount of data client side, LiveView does it for you. And this is the beauty of LiveView. This is something we haven't really talked about yet. LiveView is a declarative framework. You will never have to tell LiveView how to do something. And this is no different. You don't have to tell LiveView how to manage your, you know, 1000 Taylor Swift songs that you are trying to display to the user uh, in order to take them on a walkthrough of the errors tour because the live view framework contains all the code that actually manages that data client side and exposes to you the developer a really sleek api for you to do things like update data in that data set which was called a stream add something to it clear it out bulk edit remove uh, and so on so live view handles the hard parts of that for you and um, you kind of just are focused on what you care about as an application developer. I love it. There's, there's so much power in the framework and it keeps getting better. Um, I'll just mention this. I want to move on to some of the things in the book, but um, anywhere that Elixir can run, live view can run. We've seen it in embedded systems, which is really cool with nerve, the nurse project and then live view native that exists. We'll have it on mobile. It's great. Um, Bruce, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, so you wrote designing electric systems with OTP. I have it here. Bruce, you need to sign this for me. I need it. This is, like, <laughs> I, I go to sleep with this every night. It's all, it's all about the design for me. Um, this new book though, is as much about design as it is about web development. And I know you cover a lot of this in your training, but can you talk about, uh, the value of sort of focusing on patterns? Like a lot of books that are covering a framework are just trying to teach you enough to, this is kind of how it works. Here's your mount function. Here's your render function. You guys go the extra mile. And I want to kind of understand what the thinking is behind that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've heard it said by actually specifically by a man named Melvin Cedeno at a conference that we had called Lone Star Elixir in 2020, that Elixir is reduce. And what it really meant was that Elixir is two different things. And one of them is how do you compose functions? And with Elixir, that does mean reduce. How do you take something like that plug connection and do a little bit of work to it and return another connection? Whether that little bit of work is fetching a session or, or managing some small bit of security or actually taking us from, from the, the actual flow of, of plugs and into the router where we actually start to make decisions in the framework. So at one level, Elixir is about reduce. And at another level, Elixir is all about what it is in every functional language. It's this ability to manage uncertainty. It's, it's dealing with the worst word in a programmer's language, which is maybe, right? Maybe is difficult for programmers. And that's, that's where we come from. We come from simple abstractions and simple pipes in Elixir and simple composition in Haskell to the place where we have to deal with, with the real complex features like, like monads and, and the, the width composition. But the way that we think about layering applications in live view determines how beautiful the applications that we build, how easy that they will be to maintain and whether we are fighting the framework along the way. And it essentially means that we're going to start with some data and live view has, has graciously defined that for us. And then we're going to think through ways to transform that data and actually test within, within that realm. And then we're going to put layers on top, some of which are managed by the framework, like our dependencies that, that handle the, um, 
the complex parts of our application so that we don't have to write them. And the lifecycle management, which is managed by supervision, but some of those are exposed in additional layers in our application. Like we have a boundary layer where we'll handle things like, oh, I don't know, external interfaces to a database or managing user uncertainty in the form of user input. Um, and we actually go through things like schemaless chain set, it sets in forms so that we map those abstractions all the way from the back end. We apply user data, manage that uncertainty with the right data structures, whether it's a change set or a tag tuple or an exception. And then we're able to consume those beautiful boundaries in our application. And that, rather than a list of features, separates the good concepts, the good trainings, the good books from the bad ones. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think taking the time to build something that is extendable, because, you know, the truth is, we write these books and we do these courses and folks are going to like copy paste stuff. You know, you don't want that on your conscience. Yeah. Thanks for that. You've kept me up all night. <laughs> I'll, I'll add that. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have said this before and I absolutely mean it. I have learned so much from you, Bruce, from working on this book, not just about live view, which I think, you know, we've both been learning as we go, but about, especially about how to architect and how to design Elixir applications and OTP app applications, a call back to your previous book. Uh, and I think that's what really sets this book apart from, you know, the, the, the live view documentation and another shout out to Chris McCord and to the, to the live view team is really excellent. It's not just, you know, here's a function, here's what it does. There's lots of good narrative stuff in there about how to do uploads, you know, how to set up your forms and so on. But um, the book really goes beyond that to talk about how you should be designing your live view applications. And a live view application isn't just a live view, it's a Phoenix application. So it goes all the way from the design of your database tables, right, all the way up through to that front end with your live view um, and your template, that thing that the user sees. So that's really where Bruce's expertise and opinions around how to architect these applications, uh, you know, things like, and this may sound familiar to, to readers of his previous book, but things like separating the uh, core from the boundary of your application, things like building out really elegant functions to query your database with like this sleek pipeline of these single purpose reducer functions and sort of applying that same type of design and that same type of thinking that you see elsewhere in the Phoenix app to the actual design and architecture of the live view itself to the way we think about the different types of live view components and layer them to build these elegant UIs. Um, I've become a better programmer just more broadly from reading this book, never mind learning about live view, not reading, writing this book with Bruce. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. And one of the things that it was fun to see was as the book evolved, we started to see the composition strategies in live view itself change. Like a good example was the components. They went from these stateless components to function components that actually protected us from problems in type, with, with problems with HTML structure and, and actually surface this functionality in beautiful ways because of the abstractions in the Elixir language itself. So for example, we have these beautiful tilde H sigils that allow us to specify quickly the data type for the live view components. And these sigils are exposed in turn with a little line that says use Phoenix component. And that use Phoenix component backs up to a macro. And, and there are also some very elegant abstractions in the way that we manage forms that take advantage of Elixir protocols. But all of these things kind of layer on top of each other. And so the opportunity to kind of explore that with Sophie and, and kind of have this, this relationship through a book with the team that works on on Phoenix and and works on the Elixir language itself has been really a fabulous thing. Yeah, and I think I think Sophie called out the documentation, which is really incredible and really good. What I love about this book is that it is building an application in action. I know I'm kind of like hearkening to another book series, but uh, seeing it in motion, essentially, right? Let's build a thing, let's ideate, let's design, and kind of like go through it. So it it does add a good amount um, on top of the documentation, which is already really incredible. One thing that I want to kind of talk about is in your book, uh, there's a lot of generated code. So one thing that I really like about Phoenix and the way that it sort of started to shape up its generation strategy is 
there's a lot of taking advantage of Elixir macros, which happens, but when you are, you're running a generator, it's essentially dumping a bunch of code in your project, um, which is really interesting um, because it gives you the opportunity to change and manipulate things and really get into it and see how things work. Um, This book dedicates part one to code generation. Can you guys talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, using generated code as a way of uh, showing how things work, looking at conventions, and sort of what the thinking was behind that? Yeah, it's funny. You could you could see both Sophie and me break into shakes and cold sweats because the the code generation that makes things so elegant, <laughs> beautiful for the, for the user is a, a difficult thing to manage when the framework is is underway and under development. Um, we thought it was worth this cost to, just to serve to better serve the Phoenix community, and I think I'd, I'd make that decision again. But the idea that we can learn from experts like like Chris McCord and, and the rest of the Live View team by reading that kind of really excellent proven opinions was was a fantastic thing to me. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Sophie. I mean, I feel like you certainly probably have more to say on the generators. Maybe we can drag it out of you. But um, yes, there was a lot of churn in writing the book on the generator portion of things. And that's kind of where most of our efforts kind of focused as we've had to put out newer and newer releases. So I just want to thank our readers for their patience. Um, I feel like what often happens is that we'll release a new version of the book. And then a day later, like a flood of comments will come in saying, you know, this, that, and the other thing is out of date because that's how quickly the live view has been moving. Um, so, you know, just know that we're working on it and eventually this book will be sealed and printed, but we do appreciate uh, the patience of our readers and all the feedback certainly that you guys have been putting in. But yeah, I mean, generators, I think are part of the compelling story of not just live view, but Phoenix in general. Um, they are opinionated, I think, but not too opinionated. They generate what you need for your web app to kind of take away the boilerplate in the toil, which is one of the sort of biggest themes you'll see running through both Phoenix and Live View. You see it often in Live View when we say, or when I say a lot, that the framework handles the hard parts. You don't have to write the tedious details of, let's say, client server communication over a web socket. Another way that the framework handles the hard parts with Phoenix and Live View is with these generators. You could generate, um, you know, an entire functioning Live View application with just, you know, one line of a command that you're going to execute to tell that generator what to do. And that's not a totally novel uh, feature for a web framework. I think Rails also has a long history of generators, but you really do get a fully functional, uh, highly interactive, single page web application backed with all of the power of OTP, all the concurrency and the fault tolerance, and all of that real time capability that being embedded in a Phoenix app with a PubSub server uh, provides to you. And you can do that with, as I said, just one line and then hit enter and then you've generated it. So what we try to do in the book is uh, use the generators because you'll use them as a developer because they are that good. Then we try to walk you through what was generated so that you do get an understanding of how the app is architected because the generators put out code that is architected correctly. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that tends to happen with, with a generation type type setup is that there are some strong opinions and that these opinions might vary based on the mechanism that you choose to, to expose your interface, right? Like, so a lot of Phoenix is exposed in, in effectively the functions of the framework themselves. And then there are also places where, where we want to kind of add convenience for the users. And so we expose these ideas with, with things like macros, um, whether they're in the use Phoenix phoenix.liveview or use phoenix.component. And we also see opinions expressed in the generators themselves. So it's it's a cool thing to see the balance between macro code, which generates compiled code at compile time, and and code generation code, which which generates code one time when you process the generator and then hands the keys of this of this new Ferrari to the customer. And the decisions between putting something in a macro or a library or a framework in the generator 
it's a really difficult one to make and get right over time. And I think that the live view and, and overall the Phoenix team has done an excellent job of, of keeping this balance. And, and what that allows is, is for a, a framework that has the right level of backward compatibility and can really provide some insulation between the customer and the framework developers in, in slowing down how quickly you have to act on things like deprecations. And, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to, to watch. I feel like I should give you guys a trigger warning next. We're going to talk about some of the changes that have happened, um, in the, the framework over time. So Sophie, I know the first version of the first production application that you put on out with live view was on, I think 0.10. So you are a super duper early adopter, um, which is great. So you've seen a bunch of changes. Um, oh, yeah. So over the course of working on this book, uh, the interest in the project exploded, right? More people started paying attention because there's really something special here as far as like what you can get, how you can become more productive as a developer, how you can put more things out into the world. Really exciting. Um, so what are some of the changes that have happened while you guys are working on this project? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that, that was more, that was the most exciting and uh, also generated the most heartburn for Sophie and I was, was the idea of what a component is that started with this, this API for stateful components and stateless components and everything in that whole component system changed from, from the early versions of our book to the later ones. And they actually started changing through a third party framework called, called surface, which was just some beautiful code that, that gives us a lot of the capabilities that are in, in the components right now. But if you think about it, there was an input control and to the Phoenix for the overall Phoenix surface area, that's one function. <laughs> but in our application, we might have several hundreds of, of, of input controls. And then you kind of spread that out across the, um, the forks and branches that we have to keep in the project all the way as we, as we take the user from one chapter through the, through the last. It, it turned into kind of a, a pretty big endeavor to, um, to keep the book up to date. But what I want to say about the users, what they're seeing in live view is just light years beyond what they were before. This, this kind of beautiful interface that's more of an HTML style makes templates that are easy to read. And this, this strategy of allowing some tight checking some type checking and some HTML structure that's actually on the page is going to make much more reliable applications as we move forward. So that's been one of the things that, that, um, you know, I've kind of had a love hate relationship with them, but they're, they're by far, um, better now than when we started the book. Yeah. If anything, I think my experience has been, um, Every time that I identify something that I wish live you could do, uh, it then will do within like a matter of days or weeks. And certainly from the perspective of trying to keep this book up to date, you know, that can be a little bit stressful. But from the perspective of a web developer that wants to use this framework, it's been pretty thrilling. Um, so, for example, we talked a little bit about streams earlier, streams in live view and how it lets you manage large data sets efficiently. Um that solved one of the biggest blockers, I would say, to live view adoption that I would encounter. Um, uploads, I remember, Stephen, you were playing around with some really complicated kind of best book. How do I get file uploads in my live view app? Which you could do. It was certainly possible for you to one, write that okay? code. I, I know, right? I spent a weekend in that. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then like a couple days later, and this is an experience I've had as well, you know, new version is released, live uploads are supported, and it's super easy to do. Um, I had that experience with, I don't even remember. I wrote a whole, I gave a whole talk at Elixir Comp one year and I don't even remember what aspect of LabVIEW was about. All I remember is that like by the time the last words left my mouth, like there was a new version of LabVIEW that meant this whole fancy, crazy workaround that this whole talk was about was like totally unnecessary. I think you had a caveat um, at the beginning that was like, yeah. Hey, just like pretend this talk came out 72 hours ago. <laughs> exactly. And it was still fun. It was still a fun thing. It was great. It was um, great. And then another example with streams, I think Bruce, you and I talked a little bit about this briefly. I don't remember exactly the details, but there was a certain feature and you had suggested, oh, we'll want to use streams here as well. 
maybe something to do with, you know, updating a group of um, products in our sort of product catalog at a, at a time. And I said something like, oh, we won't want to use streams for that yet because they don't really have a bulk update option. So it's kind of, uh, you know, not really the right fit for that kind of interaction. Now, of course, you can bulk update uh, items in your live view stream. So actually, that's like a reminder to myself that we can update the book in that section as well. Um, and so I think the reason for that is the incredibly strong dialogue between the live view team, Chris McCord, and the Elixir community. There are strong connections there. There are strong relationships there. The people building live view use live view. The people building live view talk to and listen to the Elixir community, talk to and listen to their users. And they, they know what the pain points are. They know what the blockers are and they're working like the frankly tirelessly to address all of them and to make live view. I've said this before, I'll say it again, not just a compelling web framework for folks that are in the Elixir community who are already using Phoenix. I think it's the most compelling web framework that exists uh, today. Yeah. It's really exciting. Like just, it does so many things, right? I'll, I'll shout out one of my favorite features that came out in this sort of like period verified routes, like just the big, the focus on um, developer ergonomics where, you know, you don't have to say, you know, something dot path and then pass and con and a bunch of other arguments. You just say the route and the compiler will check it for you. It's really beautiful. And again, really thoughtful. Um, and just a sign of sort of what the development team behind this um, is their focus is. It's on making it easier and better to work in this framework and in this ecosystem. Yeah. Funny story. I was working th- working with a professional class in, in, you know, programming live view, which is one of the Grokto classes that we do. And one of the users took a look at some code and I said, can you change that ID to a product? And they said, no, you can't. This is a verified route, route now. And, and I said, well, try it. And he dropped it in there. And this is a, um, like a seven year, uh, expert Elixir developer. And he said, how did they do that? And then we kind of dove, dove into the, um, uh, to the, the protocol and, and looked at how that happened to trace it all the way from the central forward is a really cool use of technology and a dramatic simple is simplification that makes everybody's life better every day in live view. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Like working with this is just, it's delightful. It feels really good. Everything from, from putting the markup on the page to testing the story is just great. I want to talk a little bit about the app that you build in the book. Um, so you did not write a chat application. So thank you for that, for not writing another chat application with Phoenix and live view and all the things I've got all the chat applications I can use or I can need. Um, the, you guys went with a game, which is which I found interesting. Can you talk a little bit about why you went with a game, um, to kind of show off live view and some of the additional features that, um, being on the beam and using OTP, uh, offers? Yeah, so a couple of points here. There's there's the game and the dashboard, and and Sophie pushed hard on making a live interactive dashboard with professional features, and that was wonderful and beautifully executed. And I also I pushed hard on the game aspect because I think that one of the things that you need to be able to see in Live View is Elixir is reduced, and how easy is it to see it when you press the right right key and then the box moves one square to the right. It's just, it really becomes easy to see and, and transformative when, when people can see the way that components are layered to that, the way the attributes kind of get checked and passed on down and the way that we can kind of group and, and manage complex ideas through one giant reduced cycle. And I love that the, the application sort of lets you dive into some of the, I guess, more not advanced features, but it lets you dive deep on things like PubSub and presence, uh, rendering graphics. Um, it's a really, really good problem domain that it's not just a matter of implement game logic and render it. You actually get to use an application like you actually would build one in production. So I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. Live view works on, on rendered text and that rendered text isn't limited to just HTML. It handles SVG in a beautiful way. And we're starting to see more of that now, but, but I, I believe that the book has a, a particularly good treatment of that. Great. Well, I have one last question for you guys and you can keep it short if you'd like. Uh, you know, you spent all this time investing in, in writing and rewriting this book over the course of, of, of at least a year. Um, again, on a boat, three, three uh, months, so <laughs> Easily, three years, yeah. three years, <laughs> three years. Um, you know, what do you want 
folks to get out of this book, spending the time with this book. Again, it's a beast. It's at, at current beta. It's about 400 pages. Uh, I'll start with Sophie. What do you want folks to get out of this book? That's a really good question. I, is it weird to say that I haven't really thought about it like that before? Um, I've more just been thinking about like what I offer to people, not so much what I want them to get out of it. Um, but I think that what I want them to get out of it is an understanding of what OTP and what a functional paradigm brings to web development and the way that it really empowers you as a developer and empowers your team to be really productive, to build apps that elegantly meet the needs of, I'll say, modern web users that require and expect a lot of interaction and kind of real-time functionality today. Um, you know, I, I, we're offering you all the things in this book. We're offering you how to build a live view application. We're offering you a look under the hood a lot of the time about how it works that you can really understand what's going on. But what I want you to get out of it is this deeper understanding of what functional development and what OTP really gives you as a web developer. How about you, Bruce? I would say two things. I would say that the first thing is that beautiful applications first have to depend on beautiful technology with beautiful abstractions. But second, they really depend more on beautiful design than any, you know, punch list of features. So I think that that's super important. And the second thing is that I believe that every good, every good course, every good book, every good conference talk that I've ever done has talked about design and abstractions because those are the hard things to read from the pages of, of internet documentation. And so I think that when I can communicate those things well, I'm happy with the product. And um, this book certainly qualifies in that area. Awesome. This book will help you fall in love with LiveView. If, you, if you're interested, if this was interesting at all, pick up the book for sure. Uh, give it a read. Uh, it covers the base technology and shows you what really amazing things you can do with it. So please pick this book up. Um, if people want to hear more about you guys, uh, where can they find you on the internet? Bruce? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm also on um, Twitter, I guess. The the application previously known as Twitter, I'm at Red Rapids there. Awesome. How about you, Sophie? Uh, yeah, I think Twitter is probably the best way. My Twitter handle is SM underscore D Benedetto, my last name. And uh, another shout out if you're interested in writing something for Proud Prop about Elixir. I want to hear about it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope you got a lot of this. Um, pick up this book. It's really, really great. Um, thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Sophie, for spending some time chatting with us about all things LiveView. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. My pleasure. Anytime I get to hang out with my friends, it's a good day. You know? Yeah. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code book club. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.